Hello and welcome to the daily coronavirus update live from Fox. I'm Claudine Wong. Thanks so much for joining us. We are going to be live streaming for you every day. If you have joined us before, thanks so much for coming back. If you're new to this program, let's just tell you we start every day at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. We live stream on coronavirusnow.com, also on the Facebook pages of our sister stations across the country. So we appreciate you being here and we always like to start off with the big picture, the latest numbers to give you a look at how the coronavirus is affecting us. And here are the latest numbers from Johns Hopkins University. If you take a look at worldwide, we're at 438,749 cases. Those are confirmed cases. China, 81,000, but important to note, business is slowly reopening in that country. Italy, which has seen some good news in terms of their numbers leveling out a bit, 69,000 cases there in the U.S. We're at more than 55 thousand cases worldwide. We take a look at things. Canada now imposing a mandatory self isolation for anyone returning to Canada. That's under the quarantine act there. New York City. That's going to be our big one here in the US of the states that are seeing huge surges in their cases. All right, more in the United States. Let's take a look specifically at what we're dealing with here. 55,243 cases. 802 people have died from coronavirus. 354 recovered. Those are the numbers that we're watching. Obviously, these keep changing. We do know at least 18 states have stay at home orders, and that affects about half of the U.S. population. So when you talk about how this has overtaken our way of life, those numbers are big. All right, let's see how the stock markets are reacting right now, because certainly we're watching that. We have seen green territory today, and that's good news. The Dow Jones is up about 4.8%. The S&P also up about 3%. And so that's good news. It seems to be reacting to uh, obviously the stimulus package that has made its way through the Senate. We get closer to agreement. We saw a rally yesterday. Analysts say it's losing a little bit of steam in the global markets, but we'll keep an eye on the numbers for you and to see how our markets are reacting. All right, and if you're just joining us again, we are streaming for you every day, 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific, coronavirusnow.com, also on your Facebook pages for our sister stations across the country. We do want to focus, though, our attention right now on New York City because, wow, that is a state that has seen some big numbers and some big increases really over the last couple of days. We've got reporter Mike Sachs from Fox 5 New York joining us live from home. And we talked to you as you are holed up in your house and really the situation there. When you got the number of confirmed cases in New York doubling every three days, it is a scary time. Do we think, Mike, that these are because everyone's getting tested or that the infection is just rapidly spreading? It's probably a combination, right? It's a combination. Right now they're saying it's because a lot of the testing has been coming in faster and more furious as from the earlier days. But of course the virus is still spreading too. Now that number, every 3.4 days the numbers are doubling. That was the figure from yesterday. Today the figure it's slowing. It's to every 4.7 days the numbers are doubling. These figures are from Governor Cuomo's press conference earlier today and it's a downward trajectory. It was every two days on Sunday, every 3.4 days on Tuesday, 4.7 days today. So he warned that these numbers are fluid. We may not be sure if these are actually accurate, but if that's the trajectory, it means that the social distancing and the business closures that we've been seeing here in the city and the state may be working. Yeah, and, and that's what we hope, right? That's the flattening the, the, the curve that maybe we, we have some impact of the numbers and we're not just a victim to our numbers. You know, the, the big question is the whole reason everyone's staying at home, the whole reason you're at home right now is so that the hospitals don't get overwhelmed. And certainly that's mm -hmm. been the big fear when you talk about the shortages of masks and protective gear, ventilators. How is New York doing in terms of making sure your health care workers have what they need? New York still needs to get more. Uh, Governor Cuomo has said they're anticipating about 140 or so, or 130 or so thousand beds necessary. Right now, there are 53,000 beds. He's trying to get more medical professionals in, more building of hospitals ready with federal help. Uh, he projects perhaps with a very aggressive ramp up measures to get close to 120,000 beds. Uh, and that's that's something. It's a lot more than what we that yes. what New York State currently has. Uh, but then there's also getting the ventilators. That's a big issue. Uh, he anticipates needing 30,000 ventilators in the state. Right now there are 4,000. There's uh, 7,000 more on order, another 4,000 coming in. Uh, that gets close, but not enough 
to the to the 30,000 necessary total. He spoke about perhaps working out a way to get people to share ventilators two at a time. Uh, this is wow. all worst case scenario, but they're projections that are still quite real. Yeah, you know, when we look at the numbers, I mean, we hear about a case of a, a, a teenager who passed away in California, and we're certainly, it makes us look at the numbers, and specifically because in New York you have so many numbers to look at, um, you know, in terms of who's being most impacted and who's going to need those hospital beds. I know the numbers I looked at said 95% of New York City is almost 200 deaths. Uh, half were under the age of 75. So while we are worried about our senior population, is this this deep analysis going on, on really getting the message out to how many different people can be affected regardless? No one's no one's immune from from the impacts of this virus. Yeah, so uh, the governor was, was also, uh, and I keep referring to the governor because, of course, that's where most of our information is coming. The mayor hasn't yet spoken in New York City, but Governor Cuomo has said and, and told young people throughout the state, of course, you can still get this. You can be a vector for the virus. One moment. Uh, great, Akiva. Now, I'm talking on the news, but thank you very much for letting me know. That's my uh, son coming what, in Mike, telling me that I love package it. arrived. I think yesterday, <laughs> yes, well, packages are important. And uh, yesterday, I know you said you sent them on a car ride around, but this is the world we're yeah. living in, right? Like, how old are yeah, your kids? Yeah, absolutely. How old yeah, are you? Uh, that's my six and a half year old who's irrepressible. My three year old is, is a little more pays attention to what we say, so he hasn't come barging in. But you might have heard knocking on the window. That was my son trying to get my attention. He well, found multiple will, ways to get into I will the tell room. you, Mike, if they, want, <laughs> if they want some TV time, we could all use a little goodness in our life. And, yeah. and, and kids make us smile all the time. So I, I actually <laughs> love hearing, hearing the sounds of your kids in the background because it reminds us yeah. all to, you know, maybe we need to be distracted by packages arriving, right? Yeah, yeah, their activities for him to keep occupied while I work and my wife works. We're trading off in this computer. We both have full-time jobs, of course. Uh, but to, to answer your question again, um, you know, the most vulnerable remain the elderly, those who have pre-existing medical conditions, lung conditions especially. And according to Governor Cuomo now in our state, 30,000 uh, New Yorkers have tested positive. 12% of those who have tested positive are hospitalized. And 3% of those positives are in the ICU. Those in the ICU are almost entirely of that vulnerable population. There are still those who are under the age, under the vulnerable population. I personally have a friend who's 44 years old, good health, and he's currently intubated in a ventilator in a hospital in New York oh, City. So it's so quite scary. It's, um, it, it's something that, that is impacting us all. And even though they say that those of the less vulnerable demographic are, again, less vulnerable, it can still hurt anyone. Yes, and we, and we don't know enough to say, yeah, you're safe or I'm safe or anyone really is safe. And that, that is the scary part. Do you feel like these numbers and, and the ones that you're getting from the governor has, have changed or altered the way people are kind of are addressing this? I mean, it is hard. If we have almost half the country in a shelter-in-place order, it has changed life for everybody. But when we look to New York, we look uh, for, one, solutions that work for you guys. Because if it can work in New York, then maybe it can work everywhere else. But... Mm -hmm. um, you know, is it also changing kind of the way people are addressing this? Oh, absolutely. Um, people are staying apart. People are staying in their homes. The only ones going into work are essential workers. And even those, like, frankly, the media, are on a reduced schedule, shifted schedule. So I'm at home today. I was in the office yesterday. I'll be in the office tomorrow. It's frightening to my family. It's frightening to me. But we're doing our job is to keep the public informed as well. Uh, one thing that I do want to note, uh, what you had mentioned. Oh, here's my three-year-old. Hello. Hey, so I, I'm on. I'm on TV right now. I, I'll be right back down. Okay. Yeah, and there he is. He has food all over his face. Oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, so I, I got to talk a little bit more. Right, right well, he had something oh, important to say I, too. I, so yes. don't discount. <laughs> <laughs> and my wife is carrying him away. <laughs> Great guys, I'm sorry this just went off the rails, but this is the, no this is the reality of working in TV yeah, it now. Is, you know uh, what? It's no problem. <laughs> But but what I was going to say is Governor Cuomo had mentioned in his press conference today as he was talking to the president that because New York is the first wave and we're getting hit the hardest, that also means we will know the most coming out of this because there are still several states that are getting hit now and their numbers yes. are looking along the curve that we were on just a week or two ago. So Governor Cuomo said once we reach the peak, which he's expecting to be in about 21 days, then if we're on the way down after that, we'll be able to then take some of the emergency supplies we've received should we get them. 
and be able to then move them over to the next place that's reaching its peak. And he said he would personally manage and go on site to those areas as well that, that need New York's assistance. Yeah, we are all in this together. 21 days feels like a long ways away, uh, but hopefully yeah. we get there sooner than later. All right, Mike, thanks so much. Thanks for uh, bringing us into your home and for giving us a perspective uh, not only of life with family, but uh, life in New York. And, and I wish the best for your friend who is in the hospital right now, and uh, we'll keep our thoughts Thank with him. Thank you. All right, thanks, Mike. All right, if you are just joining us, uh, this is your coronavirus update live from Fox. I'm Claudine Wong. Thanks so much for joining us. We are live streaming for you every weekday. We start at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. We are on coronavirusnow.com. We are also on Facebook pages at our sister stations across the country. So wherever you are watching, uh, you can leave comments below on those Facebook pages and we will see them. We like to get questions answered by our medical experts coming to us from across the country. And so we always love to hear from you. All right, let's take you now to San Francisco and Dr. Rinjin Misra, internal medicine specialist based in the San Francisco Bay Area. Dr. Misra, thanks for joining us again. Of course. How are you doing, Claudine? Oh, I'm good. You know, we're all hanging in there, um, you know, and, and I, I hear these numbers from New York City and, you know, and we hear about those other cases too, the people who you don't know why they got m more sick than, you know, if they're not in a vulnerable population, they didn't have underlying health conditions. And it, it certainly makes us, I think, all more aware. I mean, I imagine medical professionals across the country getting calls, well, well, why is this and why is this? And the problem is we don't really have clear answers, right? Right. Um, some of the symptoms of coronavirus, uh, now that we're finding out, sometimes you can have digestive issues. Uh, so people are coming in with abdominal pain, diarrhea, vomiting. And, you know, if two, three weeks ago, we would never have thought, oh, should I think coronavirus? But now we're thinking that um, more, you know, information is coming in about lack of smell, lack of taste, loss of smell. And those symptoms can also be linked uh, to, you know, coronavirus infection. So every single hour, every single day, we're getting new information. And not only is it a lot for the public, uh, you know, to absorb, but even for our health professionals, we continuously have to uh, change the way that we're thinking um, and triaging our patients as we see them. I, I, I want to make it clear, though, I think this hasn't really changed your advice to people on how they should protect themselves, right? Advice kind of has stayed the same from the beginning, the social distancing, the washing your hands, the being very careful. Regardless of this new information, you know, I think it's just be more vigilant about the things that you've already been told to do. Exactly. And I want to use this, uh, this platform to be able to say that. New York is being hit very hard and you know all, all the health professionals and of course the viewers out there our heart goes out to New York and what they're going through um, and I really don't wish that upon them anyone else you know in the world or even um, the state that you're living in but that is the reality of the situation and the only way the only way that we can make a difference um, individually is by staying at home and this is not only for California this is for every single state in America because it's not a matter of if you're going to be affected by it. It's it's a matter of when, and we need to be prepared. You know, New York has been hit, um, and and like um, Governor Cuomo was saying, it's only a matter of time before we're going to be in their position if we don't take the necessary steps. And the main necessary step, nationally, is to stay at home, is yep. to avoid any unnecessary social contact. And when you do have to go to the grocery store, to maintain that six foot distance, I, I just can't stress that enough. Do you see out in your life, though, people violating that? Maybe I mean, every healthy people have a hard time embracing the fact that they can get sick. I mean, it's just kind of a natural human re human reaction. Unfortunately, I do see that. And, uh, you know, it it really bothers me only for the fact that, of course, younger people think they're invincible. Um, but the reality of the situation is there are young people who are fighting for their lives as we speak, and they're on ventilators, uh, and many of them have actually succumbed to this disease. Yeah. So even though the majority of the patients who are adversely affected by this disease are older than 65 and may have underlying health conditions, there are also many, many people who are younger than 65 and are really um, you know, fighting for their lives right now. And that's what I want you to take away from this. Anyone can get the disease and anyone can get hit very hard. So and, no one is immune to this, like you said earlier. And Dr. Misra, I think as the testing happens, I think, you know, someone was just saying to me the other day, that's when we'll start hearing, oh, I have a friend who has COVID-19. Oh, I have another friend. Right now, you know, it, it is, I think, not as common to hear someone say, yes, my friend has it. And, and then it becomes, it definitely becomes more personal. And I think when it becomes personal, that's when people start to 
pay heed to the, the restrictions and the mandates that are in place, which is good, but I wish that people would just do it sooner because, like I said, it's a matter of time before you're going to have someone that you know directly that's either positive, that's either in the hospital, unfortunately, or, you know, worst case scenario, that had a very bad outcome. And we're trying to avoid that. Yeah. We're really, really trying to avoid that. So don't wait for that call or that information to be passed on by social media or text or something that, hey, do you know that this person is positive or you hear of you know, bad news? Don't wait for that. Let's try to limit that bad news. And the one way we all can do this, just stay at home. Yep. Stay if you home. stay at home, yes. you don't pass it to anyone if you have coronavirus and you don't know yet. And someone else who may have it and doesn't know yet can't pass it to you. It's the easiest, easiest thing to do. Just stay at home. It's going to help save so many lives. Great advice. Yes. And if you are tired of the shelter in place order, it will end sooner if we all stay at home and just stick with it now. All right, Dr. Misra, we're going to come back to you in just a little bit with more questions from our viewers. So we appreciate you sticking with us during this coronavirus update. Thanks. And if you are just joining us, I'm Claudine Wong, and this is your daily, weekly update. We come to you every day, 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. We stream for a couple of hours, give you updates from across the country, check in with our medical experts and our reporters from across the country at our sister stations. You can find us on coronavirusnow.com. You can also find us on the Facebook pages of our sister stations. We had just talked to Dr. Misra. We're going to go back to her. So if you have questions, put it in the comment section. We love to see them and uh, we'll try to get as many questions answered as we can. All right, let's go back to San Francisco because we're going to talk about this stimulus bill. We got Greg Lee, political reporter for KTVU Fox 2 in the San Francisco Bay Area. And let's talk about this bill. It's huge. It covers a lot of territory. We still have some steps to go before people might see some checks in their mailboxes. But this was a big deal and the markets like it, Greg. Yeah, Claudine, $2 trillion, the largest stimulus plan in the history of our country. And it came after several days of kind of partisan sniping that We've started to become accustomed to in the Senate as they kind of work through this. But after midnight uh, last night in Washington, D.C., some of the senators came out. Mitch McConnell, the Senate Majority Leader, said we have a deal with the White House and Senate Democrats. Uh, Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin has been in there a lot of this time. Uh, and, and that's the big deal. But now some other hurdles to cross. They have to get it passed in the Senate, which will be a formal vote later today. 60 senators have to approve it. Then it will go to the House which will also have to approve it, then it'll go to the president for signing. But the bottom line is this is a lot of money, which is indicative uh, of how serious this coronavirus has been and what a toll it's taken on the American economy. Yeah, Greg, let's, we'll break it down in just a moment, but I, I do want to, they, they've been talking about, when you talk about the partisan sniping, you, they've also been talking about how sometimes, you know, things go through the Senate and then they just stop in the House or vice versa. But it, it appears that all you know, congressional, all lawmakers have been kind of in on this. So House representatives have been there, too. So so we are expecting it to kind of make its way through now that that we have some kind of agreement, right? Yeah, and, and there's no doubt that I think across the aisle, Republicans, Democrats, many have said this is not a partisan issue. This is about getting money uh, in the pockets of the American people, as many of them are laid off or not working or working from home and trying to deal with the impact of that. Yeah. Okay. Let's break it down for people to know what they could expect if this kind of goes through. I mean, we've got 500 billion. That's for the corporation industries hit hard. We've got direct payments to families of up to three grand, 350 billion in small business loans, 250 billion unemployment aid, 100 billion for hospitals. We know this is the largest rescue package really kind of ever approved. And I saw a number that says nearly half what the government spends every year. So it's enormous. When you talk about unemployment, what's it doing? Because so many people, you got 250 billion. How is that really being spent so that people really, you know, can can get more money to them? Right. It's just it's it's upping upping the benefits. Right. And, and this was one of those sticking points for Senate Democrats. They wanted to see unemployment expanded. So what this does is extends unemployment for four months, in addition to whatever states are providing for unemployed workers. And that's six hundred dollars a week. And what it does do is extend to, to gig workers and freelancers that are receiving health care from their company, but not currently working and not currently being paid. So that was a big point for Senate Democrats. Claudine, I do want to mention, you, you talked about that $500 billion loan program uh, for large businesses. That was the major point mm -hmm. of contention between Democrats and Republicans, was Democrats felt like there wasn't significant oversight of that, keeping in mind that about $50 billion of that is set aside for passenger airlines that we've obviously seen take a major hit because people are not flying uh, right now. So 
instead of trying to get that number down, it sounds like Senate, Senate Democrats are saying, we just want oversight. And likely what that will look like is a new inspector general just to have oversight over how that money is allocated, in addition to a congressional oversight committee to make sure that there are certain uh, strings attached to how these loans get put out. Right. I mean, no one wants to see a big, you know, bonuses at the end of the year at the corporate level using bailout money, which is uh, certainly what you know, we encountered before when there were big government bailouts, you know, and so it seems to me, right, when it came to the stimulus package that it just kept adding, right? We didn't take away something that maybe Senate Republicans wanted, but we added something that the Senate Democrats said, okay, we'll give you that if we can also have, have this, and it just kind of kept building. Right. They were looking to add restriction restrictions and, and to add kind of new language in that bill that would make sure that they would feel like they were protected. And, and Claudia, that big question for folks is about that direct check to the American people, to families, to individuals. I do want to mention for folks before they kind of get their hopes up that kind of the limit is uh, people that make less than $75,000 in uh, adjusted gross income annually. And that's based on your latest tax return. So if you're above that threshold, you will not see that $1,200 check. But if you are in that criteria, you'll see that $1,200, $2,400 for couples, but then $500 for every child under the age of 17, uh, which could ostensibly help a lot of these families who, who aren't working by Well, I wonder, since uh, you're in the San Francisco Bay Area, there's a lot of people who that number, 75000 means something different if you're in Oklahoma, and it means something different if you're trying to pay your rent in San Francisco. Right. And, and in fact, uh, New York Governor uh, Andrew Cuomo said this morning, because you talked about some of that money that's being given to states that are hard hit by this, like California and New York. He said today during his morning press conference, he doesn't think it's enough because in his eyes, uh, he, he believes New York will only get about one point three billion dollars of that state money from this bill. And he doesn't think that goes far enough because of the economic impact that New York has had, as you know, the, the largest number of coronavirus cases so far in the nation in New York. Yeah, it's the it's impact and the cost of living, certainly a, a hard thing to calculate. All right, Greg Lee reporting from San Francisco. Thank you so much for that. Thanks, All right, if you are just joining us now, thanks for tuning in. I'm Claudine Wong, and this is your daily coronavirus update live from Fox. We come to you every day, every weekday, I should say, for a couple of hours. We start at 1 p.m. Eastern and 10 a.m. Pacific, and we really check in across the country and around the world for the very latest on how this coronavirus pandemic is affecting us all. And speaking of how it is affecting us, we want to go to Los Angeles, California, because certainly um, some tough news coming out of Southern California. Gigi Graciet with Fox 11 Los Angeles talking about the country's first coronavirus death of someone under the age of 18, at least uh, that we know right now. Um, and certainly this one is you know, every loss that we have from uh, coronavirus I I is tragic. There has been this sense, Gigi, though, that young people, and especially young people without any underlying health conditions, are safer. And, and this certainly kind of challenges that, right? That's right, Claudine. Good afternoon. We're in Lancaster, California. This is about 70 miles north of downtown the Los Angeles city center. This is a small city, and this is where that young man lived. He was only 17 years old, and this morning we're learning he had been sick for about five days, had not been tested, was rushed to the hospital where he died. Now, at the hospital here, they gave him a test for COVID-19, and it did come back positive, according to the mayor here. It was part of the update that the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health gave yesterday. But shortly after, they appeared to backtrack, saying they now need to investigate this death further and that the CDC is going to be looking at it. But the mayor of Lancaster just told us moments ago that this young man had no pre-existing health conditions and that his father is also sick. But right now, they're not going to test his father. As you know, there is a shortage of tests because they're going to assume that if the son died from COVID-19, then the father must have it too. Now, the mayor here is so upset about 
the lack of testing that he says he's taking matters into his own hands. He has bought 100,000 coronavirus testing kits. They are, are supposed to arrive tomorrow, and he basically wants every essential worker in this town who works with the public to be tested for the virus. But if it does come back that this young man died from complications from the coronavirus, it will indeed make him the youngest person in the United States to die from COVID-19. Yeah, all the questions around it. I mean, that you know, not having clarity is interesting about whether he was tested, whether he does have this virus, because it does make people want to react differently or learn lessons from every case that we hear about and every kind of outlier case that we know about, because everyone wants to know, well, how should we change our structure given this case? But it sounds like it's too early to do that. Well, contact tracing is so important. When someone tests positive, you sort of go back and you find out where they were. Were they with the general public? Were they close to a lot of people? And in this case, the mayor says it's extra important because according to the mayor of Lancaster, the young man's father, who is also sick, mm -hmm. is an Uber driver. So you can um. imagine he may have had a lot of contact with the public. Now, we reached out to Uber. They won't confirm whether or not any of their drivers have been diagnosed with the coronavirus, but the tracing there would be very important. We saw this happen in South Korea. They've had excellent results with test, treat, and trace. You basically test someone. If it comes back positive, you treat them as best as you can, and then you start tracing who they were next to, who they were close to. You don't just assume that everybody else has it. Yeah, that's scary. You know, going back to the mayor buying the tests himself, I mean, is he is he writing that check personally? Is it coming from the city? And, and you know, where did he buy them from? He says he has authorized the city to purchase 100,000 kits. This is huge because the county of Los Angeles, which has a population of millions of people, yesterday announced they just got 20,000 tests and they've purchased or entered into an agreement to purchase 100,000 tests per week from a South Korean firm. So for this small city with a population of only 160,000 people, this is absolutely huge. The mayor just gave us this news. He says some of the tests are scheduled to start arriving tomorrow. He's going to get them to the local hospitals. Testing, of course, a huge issue across the country and Lancaster, California, Los Angeles, no exception there. Yeah, I wonder, though, you know, if, if he's able to do that, then other mayors are going to be sitting there going, well, I want to do that for my city and how that will how that will affect and impact things going forward. And, and if, if Lancaster is going to be a place that everyone starts going to <laughs> in hopes of getting a test there. Well, you'll have to have a direct connection to the city, either work in the city or live here and have a reason to be tested, i.e., the mayor says he wants all essential employees, people who are out working, to be tested, not only first responders, but essential employees. Those at grocery stores, he used as an example Costco. He thinks every Costco employee in the city of Lancaster should be tested because they work so closely with the public, grocery store employees, etc. Now, the tests apparently are available. I know L.A. County has purchased them from a South Korean manufacturer called Sea Gene. And Sea Gene says right now they're manufacturing 1 million test kits per week. And they're trying to ramp up their production because the goal is to manufacture 2 million test kits per week. Wow. Well, that'll be amazing. Yes, I think it's always the question of who should be tested, who wants to be tested, and then who can actually be tested based on the supplies. All right. A uh, lot to still uh, unpack there in Lancaster as we try to learn about this very young victim. Gigi Garcia, thank you so much for that report. All right. If you are just joining us now on our daily coronavirus update live from Fox, I'm Claudine Wong. Thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, we are going to be streaming live every day for you on coronavirusnow.com. Also on the Facebook pages of our sister stations across the country. We start at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. We go for about two hours and we really check in around the country and around the world for the latest on how the coronavirus pandemic is developing and impacting the United States and the world. So we appreciate you joining us and uh, we're going to take you now to Seattle. And that's where Brandy Cruz with Q13 Seattle is. And so the Washington situation, we all watch very closely. New York obviously has become, you know, the big hotspot for cases, but Seattle, Washington, everyone has been going through it there for so long. And uh, your Governor Inslee just made some, you know, big statements on really kind of hunkering down and, and really tightening the belt, Brandy. 
Yeah, I mean, it is interesting when you talk about, you know, we were the first confirmed case in the country. We had the first confirmed fatality in the country, yet about a dozen states took actions to tell citizens to stay at home, you know, direct enforceable actions prior to Washington State's Governor Jay Inslee doing it on Monday. And really, I think his hands were tied on this. You had municipalities in the area saying, okay, well, we'll do our own stay at home orders if the state isn't gonna do one. You had Boeing, which of course has a tremendously large workforce here announced on Monday that it was going to stop production operations and have tens of thousands of workers stay at home. And so then you saw the governor finally come out, he gave a very formal address to the people of our state and said he was issuing what he called a stay home, stay healthy order uh, for folks here. And, and people across the state anticipated it, Claudine, for, for yeah. days. And you had a lot of people here who I want to give credit who were already doing that, who had already taken steps to stay at home and limit non-essential travel and contact with other people. But you know, just a few days before the governor issued it, you had people, there's a beach in Seattle, uh, and it's a very California-like beach, so you'll appreciate it. It's called Elkai Beach, uh, and it was a very nice weekend, uh, unusual for Seattle, which is typically cloudy and rainy this time of year, and the sun came out. You had people at the beach like it was a spring break party, uh, while other people yes. were hunkering down at home doing what they should be doing, and so the governor saw that. He saw people playing pickup basketball uh, on Capitol Hill in Seattle. Uh, and so the governor realized that if I don't make this mandatory, you're going to continue to have groups of people who don't do it. So well, the governor think, was really left yeah. without a choice. Isn't that frustrating to the people? It's always it's not frustrating for the people who went to the beach. You don't seem to think it's a concern. It's frustrating for the people who are at home and saying, well, why why am I doing this if they're not doing it? Because it's really not going to be effective. So maybe none of us should be doing it. And really, you know, across the country, when some states do it, other states don't do it. And that's why some people have pushed for, you know, a nationwide shelter in place order. But I think in, in terms of how Governor Inslee is calling it a stay at home, stay safe, or is that, is that what, I mean, everyone's got a different name. And yeah. I think mm -hmm. it's because of how it gets received, they're trying to to, I don't want to say tiptoe, but walk, tread carefully, maybe. Well, well, no, I mean, it's a brilliant observation because I was briefed by the governor's staff about this, his chief of staff and some others about the decision making that went behind it. And this was very, very deliberate, not to call it a shelter in place, not to call it a lockdown. Because what do you think of when you hear shelter in place? I'm from the Midwest, I think of maybe a tornado. Mm -hmm. I have family in Florida, I think of maybe a hurricane, or, and I hate to put it this way, but an active shooter situation. So that, that phrase we associate with things like that. And so the governor really wanted to make sure that, uh, one, they didn't scare people, and two, there was no confusion. When you call it a stay at home order, the order tells you exactly what you should be doing. You should be staying at home. And so there's no confusion for anyone. So absolutely deliberate in the messaging from the governor's office uh, and in putting that out to people. And one of the reasons it took our governor so long is that he realized that no matter what, you have to have public buy-in. So for mm -hmm. days, he had tried to convince the public about why this was so important because it, it is a gross misdemeanor to ignore or flagrantly violate the order that a governor gives during an emergency situation. But to think that it's actually enforceable, you know, we're gonna have law enforcement out, you know, in the streets gathering people up isn't realistic. And so the governor wanted public buy-in. But just going back to something you alluded to, you know, the people out on the beaches as if they don't have a care in the world. Our governor, you know, he's an older guy and he has grandpa jokes uh, and he got very serious over the weekend when talking to folks here and somebody had asked him, well, what's the punishment for doing this? And he said, well, for these young kids who are out there violating this, their punishment is that they might kill their grandparent. And, and I thought that was a very strong, blunt way for the governor yeah. to make them realize that this isn't about figuring out how can I skirt around the government's rules and regulations and these bans? How can I just fly under the radar to get away, away with it? People have to realize that distancing ourselves is the only cure for this at this point. Yes. If we avoid contact with other people, there is no way that we're gonna spread it from person to person. And that's really the only thing that we can do right now. And following it, 
uh, is one of the only ways that we're going to get yeah. out from under these and restrictions. And it's not fun. Sooner. It's not fun. I get it. Oh. You know, I mean, I, but I think that, you know, we have seen that when they've had to close state parks. They're like, if we can't you trust you to say when I get there, even though I wanted to walk there, if there are 700 people there, I'm not going to get out of my car and be 705 because I decided I wanted to walk in that specific place. I want to I want to do want to switch uh, gears, though, and talk about these at home tests, because testing is the other big question. I mean, when you got 18 states under these states, at home, shelter in place, however you want to call them, orders, and then you've got these testing sites popping up. Everyone wants to know, am I possibly infected? Because we know people can be asymptomatic and they just, you know, the idea of a stay at home test is a, is a, is a great one. Yeah, so it's something King County is experimenting with, and it has some practical purposes, but it also has some purposes for them to be able to track uh, coronavirus better and cases of COVID-19 better. So what King County is doing, and it's sort of a trial run, I think, is they're asking for volunteers. And I actually just went on the site this morning, and it said that they've already got enough right now. So they're sort of overloaded with people who want these tests sent to their home. So basically what happens is you ask the county for a kit, give them a little bit of information, they mail it to you, do the cheek swab, and you mail it back. So one, uh, yes, it can help people who are at home and maybe don't want to go into a testing center uh, or don't know where to go to get one of these tests. But also when you consider the number of cases we have, confirmed cases, which is over 2,000 at this point, we've had 123, I believe it is, fatalities at last check. Those are really cases where people are sick enough that they're presenting symptoms and they have either gone into a hospital or gone in somewhere to get tested. What the county really wants to know is, I think they, the way they worded it is what's below the tip of the iceberg for people who are sheltering or staying at home uh, or for people who don't really know if they have it because their symptoms aren't very severe um, doing these tests at home perhaps as many as 300 a day is going to give the county a much better idea of what are we really looking at here yeah. how many cases do we really have and uh, if you've got these people sending in kits from home and they're testing positive uh, it really tells you that gosh it's a good thing we have this stay at home order in effect because that person who in their house, who's not having contact with other people and who's infected, we know that they're not going to transmit it to anyone else. So there's a lot of reasons for this uh, to be an option. And like I said, it's kind of a trial basis. So it's not like this is happening widespread at this point. But when but when it's could it, I guess, is the, is, is the question. And, and it's a cheek swab, just to be clear, because I know there's been a lot of talk about when they actually do the test in the hospital, you know, the, the swab goes all the way, kind of all the way to the back of your head, it feels like for people. And, mm -hmm. and they're talking about uncomfortable. I'd be concerned that people wouldn't be doing it correctly, you know. Because... Yeah, you definitely have to include uh, some pretty uh, yeah. cut and dry, clear information about how to perform the test accurately. Um, you know, whether the county can make this more widely available to folks is unclear. Um, you know, we have a lot of people who need to be tested, obviously. And, you know, maybe if I'm sitting at home and I'm asymptomatic, uh, a test going to me isn't the priority as opposed to people who are going into medical facilities or who are have underlying conditions who need tests uh, right away. And so, uh, and, and like I said, I had just checked on the county website just a couple minutes ago and they're already kind of booked up for, for these at-home tests. And so it seems like they don't have the capacity to expand it at yeah. this point, but it's something that we're watching. All right, well, Brandy, uh, we'll take any light in this uh, dark tunnel that we appear to be in and, and hope that it, it helps us through it. Uh, Brandy Cruz, thanks so much for joining us and we we appreciate yep. the insight and, and stay safe and healthy up there. Thank you. All right. If you are just joining us now for this coronavirus update, we come to you every weekday. We start about 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. I'm Claudine Wong, and I really appreciate you tuning in as we bring you updates from around the country and around the world as we just try to wrap our minds and our arms around this pandemic that has taken over all of our lives. Let's take you straight to Detroit now as we go to Dina Santafani, who's uh, talking about really what's happening in Detroit. When we talked before, we've talked about, you know, the Motor City kind of shutting down, but now we want to talk about really kind of how it's restarting in a, in a, in a different way because if, if Ford Motor Company can do this and we see all these businesses kind of switching gears, uh, you know, it does make us feel like we're all in this together and pretty innovative in a way that we can figure out how to help. And we like the switching gears pun, Claudine, <laughs> <laughs> here in the Motor City. So, yeah, that is one of the things that we're seeing, right, uh, all over the country. And that's why we appreciate this, uh, these segments that we do because we get to hear from people all over. And there is a shared 
um, anxiety that we all feel, this connection that we feel, because mm -hmm. uh, from one end of the country, from your end, all the way over here to my end, uh, we are all feeling this very similar emotions, but at the same time, we're also seeing people really stepping up to make a difference. Um, and Ford Motor Company is doing the, just that. Let me give you the current numbers, by the way. Here in Michigan, this gets updated, by the way, at two o'clock uh, Eastern, my time, so it'll be updated in about a half hour. But as of right now, we're at about 1,791 cases. We'll call it 18 1,800 reported cases and 24 deaths. Um, and I, I got to tell you, Claudine, and this probably is something that you are dealing with as well. Um, now that we're hearing about who the victims are, it's getting harder and it is hitting home. For a while, this was something that we didn't even think about in our country. And then it came to the United mm -hmm. States and then it sort of spread and we started keeping track. And now people that we're friends with, people in our community, leaders in our community, uh, members of the police department. So, uh, and it really starts to hit home and you realize the severity of the situation. So that's one of the, that's one of the things, the, the emotional right. toll that this takes on all of us. Um, one of the biggest hospital networks here in Metro Detroit says they're reaching near capacity for patients. So hospitals short on staff, short on supplies, much like the rest of the country. So the auto industry has been stalled, but Ford Motor Company is pledging to help speed up production of much needed medical equipment. So this is interesting, using materials from different locations, Ford is teaming up with manufacturers 3M and GE Healthcare, and they're building face shields, uh, respirators, ventilators. Ford is hoping to assemble 100,000 face shields per week while also leveraging the company's 3D printing capability to build disposable respirators for health workers. So the first 1,000 face shields will be tested at area hospitals this week. So take a listen. And we're testing uh, the face shields this week in uh, Detroit area hospitals to make sure they work and then we can ramp up very quickly. We're already doing the, ma the N95 masks. Um, we're 3D printing those. Uh, with 3M, we're doing the respirators. Uh, and the goal there is to dramatically increase what they're already doing. We'd like to do it by a factor of 6X to 10X, what they're already doing. And on the ventilators with GE, we're helping them uh, prototype. We're using our engineers and our manufacturing people. And then as soon as we get uh, that right, we're gonna go like crazy. There's a national emergency. We're responding to it. Um, we are turning our amazing employees loose to solve these problems, um, and they're doing it. I'm so proud of them. Yeah, so that was Bill Ford Jr., Claudine. General Motors, Tesla also working to make ventilators. Fiat Chrysler working to make and donate more than a million face masks at all, also. So uh, this is impressive to see, isn't it? How people are, and, and there's also a health, you know, they have to be careful to protect their own health while they're doing this to help the health of others. Right, well, and you, you talk about the numbers and what you're seeing, and, and certainly uh, we know that some of the numbers are gonna swell because of testing, but, you know, I have a lot of friends who are on the front lines, uh, healthcare workers, you know, my, my friend uh, who is a nurse showing me that she was wearing an N95 mask, a surgical mask over that, and then a face shield because she goes to work every day, and she said, I'm afraid. A lot, and so it's it is great to see something that that will help. I mean, the WHO told me yesterday they're like every country, and your country specifically, is so innovative, and this is what we should be doing. It I get the sense from uh, the interview that we just saw too that there is a lot of collaboration between uh, who are normally competitors who are also kind of joined together and saying, you know, we're going to share all <laughs> we're sharing all this information, and we're all in it together, and that's got to make you know make people feel some pride in, in what's happening. Well, and what you have, you know, with these big corporations, I mean, Ford Motor Company, uh, General Motors, uh, sure, they're huge corporations, but they also consist of people who have families, who have, uh, you know, elderly parents, who have brothers and sisters who might be at risk. So when it comes right down to it, everybody wants to make this problem go away yeah. as quickly as possible and be part of the solution. I think that makes us all feel better if we feel like we're doing our even the tiniest part to help be part of the solution. So um, something else that I found interesting that I wanted to talk to you about, what, what's that? Go ahead. Uh, the first NBA player, do you remember, uh, we Rudy talked Gobert, about yeah. this guy quite a bit. He said he had no sim symptoms. The, yeah, um, Rudy Gobert from the Utah Jazz. Well, uh, then he said that he had lost his sense of smell 
and losing your sense of smell as it turns out and taste are symptoms of coronavirus. We haven't talked a lot about that until now, but ear, nose and throat doctors in England were first to put out a warning about this. And I talked to Dr. Matthew Sims. He's an infectious disease expert from Beaumont Health, and he explained a little bit of this. It's been reported from all the other countries that have uh, had uh, significant outbreaks. Um, in fact, Germany is reporting that they're seeing it in about two out of every three patients. It's uh, interesting, you know, the milder coronaviruses, the ones that cause the common cold, have been shown to do this, just not to this extent. Um, so it looks like it really can be a presenting symptom of this disease. And in fact, for the pa people who have just sort of the very mild cases, this may be the only symptom they have. So it may end up being a good screening uh, tool. If you lose your sense of smell, that's not unless you're really stuffy and you can't smell because you're just all stuffed up. If you lose your sense of smell, that's a very unique kind of a symptom. That's not something you could be like, oh, I just had one cough. Do I have coronavirus? I feel kind of tired today. Do I have coronavirus? Losing your sense of smell is pretty specific. Yeah, so that's something to think about. Now, right now, we should tell you that the CDC is not warning about the loss of smell and taste as far as that being a symptom or a red flag, but it could be something to keep an eye on, especially in younger patients who tend to have milder symptoms. So remember when you, and, and you're, so now you walk around trying to yes. smell stuff to make sure that you have a sense of smell. So I feel like we are being inundated we with are. so much information mm -hmm. to do self-analysis. But um, it's good to keep it all, you know, information is power, right? Right. And, 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 you know, he's right. It does make sense because, you know, your head hurts. Well, we're exhausted. We're stressed out. We have anxiety. Maybe you're not, you're not breathing as well. The cough and the fever, the fever was a, was a good one. But maybe everyone will just walk around their houses and trying to, to, to smell something because that is a, a unique one. And, and man, it is uh, hard to navigate through this territory. All right, Dina Centifanti, as always, we appreciate the chat. We always like talking to you and, and all the insight that you have, and, and uh, we wish you guys uh, health and safety out there in Detroit. Thank you. You too, Claudine. Talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. All right. Thanks, Dina. All right. We want to now uh, welcome you if you are just joining us. I'm Claudine Wong, and this is our daily coronavirus update. We come to you every day, every weekday, starting at 1 p.m. Eastern and 10 a.m. Pacific. We're streaming on coronavirusnow.com. We are also on Facebook pages at our sister stations across the country. And we always like to have you weigh in on the comments section there because we like to bring your questions to our medical experts, try to get you as many answers as we can. And that is why we are going to go back to San Francisco right now to Dr. Rinjan Misra to talk about our viewer questions. Thanks again for joining us. And really, let's get to it because there are so many questions. And this is a good one from uh, viewers. And, and we get this one a lot because the question is how long can coronavirus live on surfaces in my house? We are all in our houses a lot these days, <laughs> more than we necessarily usually are. So the question is how crazy about cleaning in our house do we need to be? We need to be very thorough. We need to clean off in especially high traffic areas. I'm not going to go over what surface uh, the coronavirus can, uh, you know, remain active on and for how long because that's just too many numbers for everyone to remember because it can vary anywhere from a few hours to a few days. So the best thing that you can do, not having to keep all these numbers in mind, is just to make sure that the high traffic areas, which include countertops, doorknobs, light switches, keyboards, uh, cell phones, remotes, things like that, that a lot of people are going to have access to and a lot of people are going to touch. Um, those areas, make sure you disinfect them well. Um, and I spoke about this on the news a little bit ago, and I think this will be helpful if I mention this again. Um, but you can wash most, you know, most areas with just soap and water. Um, and you need to put in a lot of elbow grease and make sure that you're scrubbing away hard. Um, if you can't do that, then you can use bleach, which you can dilute. You can uh, use hydrogen peroxide um, and also alcohol. Yeah, no, that's so there's great a lot advice. of things yeah. out there. You can do a search on the internet and you can actually get a list of all the different um, sprays and other uh, solvents that you can use that will help kill this virus off your counters, et cetera. Yeah, certainly. I mean, I, we're talking doorknobs, counters, and, and just different things. I mean, that it's hard to remember, you know, like we vacuum the house, uh, but touching the surfaces is something sometimes people forget. The I think the kitchen counter probably gets cleaned a lot, but other than that, maybe people just forget. Um, so that is great advice, and the alternatives are great advice because uh, disinfectant is hard to find these days. All right, our next question. If someone catches COVID-19, and recovers, can they catch it again 
or are they immune? And uh, we certainly seen this question from a lot of people because they want to know that somehow if they get sick, they're a little bit better off. But I don't do we know that for sure? We don't have the answer to that for sure. And it's a little frustrating. I know both as a medical professional and also um, as just a community member, because we just don't have enough answers to this right now because we haven't been testing um, people and following them who have recovered. Um, if we started testing people uh, who had the virus and then recovered, we would be using even more um, more kits that we really need to save for people who are symptomatic. So there hasn't been uh, too much data on this. Uh, what I can only say is if you had the disease, you still need to you know, keep the same precautions um, and still implement them that all of us are hopefully trying to do, which is stay at home um, and socially distance yourself. Okay, and, and our next question is on soap. Let's say you go to the grocery store and there's all kinds of soap on the on the shelves, which <laughs> I haven't seen yet in a while. But what kind is the most effective? If you have a chance or you have different kinds, you know, because certainly there's a lot of marketing that goes into soap, foaming soap, this and that. And does it does it even matter or is soap is soap? Soap is soap. And what really matters is making sure your hands are clean properly. And I know everyone has heard this so many times, 20 seconds, how to wash it, the front, the back, the thumb, um, in between your fingers, your nails. What's going to be the most important is how you wash your hands and making sure every part is clean instead of what kind of soap you're using. Yes, and, and, and if you need to go a little extra 10 seconds to be sure, you know what? It's never going to hurt. It doesn't hurt, but maybe 10 seconds less will. All right, we, we talked about the surfaces, but people still want to know, and I think it's because we don't really know and the information keeps coming in. Do we, do we have a better idea of how long coronavirus is in the air? I mean, I know grocery stores are setting up, you know, sneeze guards and cough guards, and, and it's all that stuff that we can't see that, that makes us a little paranoid. How long does it live in the air? Right. What we're, what we're seeing right now, and like I said, this is a very fluid situation, but what we're seeing right now, it, it, it remains in the air uh, as an airborne particle for perhaps up to three hours. Uh, so if you are sneezing, if you are coughing, that's why it's so necessary, number one, to sneeze into your elbow, not leave the house if you, if you don't need to. Um, but also if you are sick and you really need to get out of the house to get an essential item is to wear a mask. So and that that's the only time they're saying wear a mask is if you are yes. sick, don't wear it just because it makes you f feel better necessarily, but be, to right. protect the other people from you as opposed to protecting yourself from other people. Exactly. And it's important to remember that because we are also facing a very big mask yes. shortage. Yes. So if you if you have been, you know, collecting masks at home for whatever reason, it's still OK to not wear a mask if you don't have any symptoms. So you can keep a couple for yourself, you know, God forbid in case something happens, but please donate the rest to area hospitals which are in dire need of these supplies. Yes, so, so important. All right, our, our last question is about, you know, I mean, one of the places that people are still going to is the grocery store. I mean, we have to go and, and get food and, and they've been fairly crowded when I've been. The six feet of distance is, is, is tough. But beyond those people uh, we know trying to keep the distance and, and just making sure we wash our hands when we get home, people are, I, I see this question a lot, what about our groceries? You know, everyone's touching them. And, you know, and if we talk about surfaces, they've touched the frozen pizza, they've touched the produce, they've touched, do you have to wipe it all down before you put it away? Uh, so I'll answer that in one second. What I do want to point out, what we can learn from other countries, is that they only limit one person from the family to be able to go and get essential items. And I think that's very important for us to do here as a state and also nationally, because what I've seen when I've tried to go to the grocery store to get essential items, that we have families coming out, like nothing has changed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a mom, there's a dad, there's a few children, and everyone is just running around, you know, trying. I mean, it's hard to control children, and they're running around. Um, and they're being around other people and they're definitely not keeping that social distance. So if we want to make sure that we're making these grocery store um, grocery stores safer for everyone, we need to make sure that we're just sending one person, hopefully the same person to do that run so that we're making sure not enough, you know, not a lot of people are in the grocery stores. Now, coming back to your question about what should you do once you get the groceries, I'll tell you what I've been doing. Like I said, we don't know what surface. Um, exactly coronavirus remains active on. So what I do, this is more for peace of mind, is when I get home, I clean everything with a disinfectant wipe. And then if I don't need to refrigerate that or I don't need that item immediately and I can use it in the next few days, I just leave it in the garage. Because what we, from what we know right now, 
um, the maximum number of days that it can stay active is about four days. So if I don't need to use something, I just leave it in the garage and then I bring it in when I do need it a few days later. It's great advice. I mean, it, we just have some practical advice and things that we can do to keep us all safer. And, and you're right. I see a lot of families going to the grocery store. That's not the place to, to go out and spend the time, take a walk together, walk the dog, uh, find some social distancing somewhere else. But the grocery stores are already too crowded. All right. Dr. Rinjan Misra, thank you so much for uh, your advice and your help as we navigate through this. Uh, we, I know the viewers certainly appreciate the answers to all those questions. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. All right. And if you are just joining us, uh, we want to thank you for joining us. I'm Claudine Wong, and this is your daily coronavirus update live from Fox. We come to you every day live streaming on coronavirusnow.com. Also on our Facebook pages across the country and our sister station. So thank you for joining us there every weekday starting at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. We go a couple of hours, really just kind of check in everywhere and just get a feel on how this is changing hour by hour, minute by minute across the country in so many different states. All right, we talked about the stimulus package. This is a big deal and the markets have been responding to that. This has been something that's been worked on for days on end. It could mean direct paychecks to you, to a lot of Americans. It's a huge bill. It needs to be voted on by the Senate. Let's take you live to the Senate floor if we can package. show you uh, the as they continue to, to talk the about this. To, the, to our constituents, to these businesses, to these workers, so they know what's in this package so that they can act now because quite frankly okay and so as we're listening in this is going to go on all day we this this senate bill has to go uh, in a def number of different steps i mean we know overnight that senator mitch mcconnell came out and said hey you know we have a deal senator chuck schumer is saying okay yes the things that we had tried to get done we are now getting done and so now it has to go for a vote it's a two trillion dollar package so it's the largest rescue package ever approved it's really nearly half of what the government spends every year you get 500 billion for industries hard hit 350 billion in small business loans 250 billion unemployment aid 100 billion for hospitals and related health systems so this is what they're talking about on the floor today uh, i know we're waiting for a draft package so we can look at it more carefully but let's listen in and minimize the adverse impact of the coronavirus. And with that, Madam President, I would yield the floor. Okay, you're taking a live look at the Senate floor as uh, we wait for the next person uh, to speak about the stimulus bill that was agreed upon late last night, overnight, you know, as the senators from Madam both President. sides. The senator from Oklahoma is recognized. Let's listen in. This morning, Technical Sergeant Marshall Roberts of Oklahoma came home. It was a dignified transfer in Tulsa, Oklahoma earlier this morning. And there were a lot of people that wanted to be there, but because of COVID-19 could not. But a lot of other folks were. Tech Sergeant Marshall Roberts was killed in, a, in Iraq Wednesday, March the 11th, when his unit was engaged by indirect in, enemy fire while they were sleeping. He was 17 miles north of Baghdad. He's deployed with the 219th Engineering Installation Squadron, a subordinate unit of the 138th out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. He was in the process of building communications infrastructure as part of the fight against ISIS. The operation that Robert served in, Operation Inherent Resolve, has been a vital part of protecting our nation and bringing stability to the region. Roberts enlisted in the Oklahoma Air National Guard in May of 2014. He was killed in action as the first Oklahoma Air National Guardsman who has died, but the 20th Oklahoma National Guardsman who has died since September the 11th of 2001. The perpetual comment that I heard from the folks that I talked to about Tech Sergeant Roberts was he was one of the good guys. He was always known for having a smile on his face, was selfless, he served others all the way to the end. The night of the attack, there was a truck launcher that fired off 30 Katusha rockets at their camp as folks were sleeping. 18 of those rockets landed inside the camp facility. As the noise happened around him, Sergeant Roberts told his fellow airmen to get up, 
get going, get their body armor on. And as he stepped away to go warn other people to do the same, the rocket came. But some of the people standing right there that he had told them to get their body armor on, he saved their life. He was posthumously promoted. He was posthumously promoted to technical sergeant. He was born January the 29th, 1992 in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Marshall's parents, Sally and Randy, raised him in Owasso, Oklahoma, where he graduated from Owasso High School. His beautiful daughter, Peyton, who has been the love of his life. November the 15th, 2018, Marshall was married to Chrissy Harris. She was also in the 138th, and they met and started dating as both being a part of the National Guard there, the Air National Guard. Their deep love for God, their deep love for their country, and their obvious love for each other was a significant part of the 138th. Everyone knew them, knew what they were like, and were glad to be called their friends. He was a brother, he was a son, he was a father, he was a husband, and our state and our nation grieves him today coming home. Fun story about he and Chrissy, though. They met and started dating, as I mentioned, while they were both serving with the 138th. She had been in the 138th for 15 years, so she had actually been there longer. All right, they you've dated been four listening years before they got married in 2018. James Lankford, Senator of They've Oklahoma. They've been married just less than two years. Really talking about how uh, this has impacted, talking they about a U.S. service member coming fans, home and people not being able to problem. be there uh, because a, is a of concerns Kansas about coronavirus. You know, in Oklahoma, the schools fan. have uh, been shut problem, down definitely. as their well, coronavirus that. infections rise there. They have an Oklahoma state senator testing positive for COVID-19. So certainly this is impacting them really, you know, in so many ways, but also in those little things and those big things, wanting to be there for the service members homecoming and to welcome them back home and not being able to be there because of concerns about people being infected. And that is really what uh, Senator Langford is speaking to at this point from Oklahoma, uh, talking on the Senate floor, as certainly they take a look at the stimulus bill that they want to pass. Uh, they are expecting a vote and uh, really uh, getting checks into the pockets of Americans and getting help for the industries hit hard by the shutdowns that we have seen across the country because of the coronavirus update. All right, if you are just joining us right now, I'm Claudine Wong. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, this is our daily coronavirus update live from Fox. We come to you every weekday starting at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. We stream for you on coronavirusnow.com. We also stream for you on Facebook uh, pages across the country. So we check in with our medical professionals as well. And so if you have questions, if you have comments, please put them there and we'll try to get as many of your questions answered as we can. All right, let's give you the big picture of how this pandemic is affecting us because these numbers change so much. And if you take a look at the worldwide numbers there on your screen, these numbers from Johns Hopkins University, 438,749 confirmed cases. It's a huge number. In China, the number is 81,661. But in China, we have seen the number of cases drop, and that has allowed that country to slowly reopen businesses there, so we will have to see on the ability of China to reopen its economy and really, you know, kind of get back to business. I don't know if we can say as usual, but more normal business. In Italy, when you look at the cases there, 69,176. Obviously, those numbers were creeping up, 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 and then the last few days, we saw them plateau and then saw them drop a little bit. They're still watching to make sure it's a trend and just not an anomaly, but uh, we certainly hope that the trend is that those cases continue to drop. In the U.S., our numbers have surged. We've got 55,000 cases, 55,243. And if you take a look at the map across the country and really what we're dealing with here, you will see the numbers in the United States are confirmed cases. We've got those 55,000 and then we've got 802 deaths. And in terms of the people recovering from it, the number's at 354, but keep in mind our testing just ramping up. And so these numbers are expected to change dramatically. At least 18 states have stay-at-home orders. That affects about half of the U.S. population. So 
The testing is going to change the numbers, and then we hope our stay-at-home orders will also impact those numbers and bring them down sooner than later. Let's take a look at our stocks right now because the Dow has had a better day. We saw a little bit of a rise into the green yesterday as they talked about coming to agreement on a stimulus package. Now as we wait for this vote for the Senate and then make its way to the House and then to the President, uh, the markets are reacting favorably. The Dow Jones is up about 5%, S&P up about 3.5%. Apple is doing well. It's up almost 3%, so it's a stock to watch. Globally, it, it remains to be seen how long this trend will continue, but we'll take a, you know, a good market swing for as, <laughs> as long as we can. So we'll keep an eye on the markets for you. Certainly, all eyes are on our nation's capital and getting this stimulus package, this huge stimulus package of $2 trillion passed. All right, we want to go down to Atlanta, and we want to talk about really everything that's happening. We've got Dr. Hansa Bhargava, web medical ec editor. Dr. Bhargava, thanks so much for joining us. Let's talk about, you know, the surge in cases we're seeing in the United States. This is something we expect. It's, it's hard to, to look at our numbers and know if they're representing the surge in cases or just the identification of cases, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And we are seeing the surge, but and, and the surge was expected. The experts, the doctors said that there would be a surge. And in fact, uh, what we're seeing may be not accurate numbers because we don't have enough tests, although they are going up. And also, we don't know how many people are out there with symptoms right now. So I think that there's probably more people will, uh, experts and scientists will agree that there's probably more right now. And, and it will go up just like you mentioned in Italy and in China, it went up before it went down. So, you know, we're seeing the uptrend probably in the next few weeks. Yes, and in terms of, of are we doing enough, you know, I mean, the WHO yesterday was saying, uh, you know, no, uh, they, they would like to see countries doing more to stop the spread. I know we've got at least 18 states under some kind of shelter at home, shelter where it's safer, however they want to call it. It's the same idea that we should all be isolating and socially distancing. Uh, do you expect things, you know, in terms of, you know, a way for us to, to do more is it going to get even more harsh or are we just going to see the same thing kind of spread throughout the country? I think that sheltering in place is definitely the way to go. We need to do the social distancing. We need to stay home. And even with the you know, social distancing, perhaps, you know, there's more that we can do. I mean, we are seeing certain parts of certain cities with more people outside and that's fine, but they're not keeping that six foot distance between them. And, you know, to do small things like going to the grocery store, it doesn't have to be every day. It could be every four to five days or even once a week. So really not going out there, not being in groups of people, staying at home is just so important. And that is again, because we need to, even though the numbers of cases are expected to rise even while we're doing this. It doesn't mean we're not doing enough. We are doing well, but what that will help, what how that will help is it won't peak as quickly. And what we're trying to do is not necessarily stop the numbers from rising. What we're trying to do is flatten that velocity. So mm -hmm. flatten the curve so that the hospitals that will be overwhelmed will you know have a better chance of taking care of us as patients. You know, that is really the key. So, you know, the Internet is, is a wonderful thing, you know, when we're looking for information. It also can be a very dangerous thing. And I think in a, in a case like this, you know, we're, we were all, you know, talking about Dr. Google. There are sites where you can get great information, you know, where, where you can find, you know, what we know to be true, what we don't know to be true, what we're trying to figure out. But I also feel like in this day and age and in this day and these hours and this uncertain times, there's a lot coming across that, that, that could make the situation worse in terms of where people are getting their best advice of what to do. Yeah, and I think that's a great point. There's a lot, unfortunately, there's a lot of quote unquote fake news out there and you know people have opinions, um, all sorts of opinions, but really sticking to the government sites like cdc.gov, the World Health Organization is good for a worldview. Uh, I do believe the Johns Hopkins site that you pointed to is great. 
Uh, we at WebMD take uh, our job very seriously in making sure we only put facts out there, but really sticking to uh, places where you know the doctors and experts are giving you the facts. So, you know, be careful of what you see. I've had a lot of questions myself about, mm -hmm. well, you know, if you breathe a certain way and if you do, uh, you know, you take garlic water or other things, will that prevent the virus? And usually the answer is no, mm -hmm. uh, because those are facts that people are putting out there. And it's almost a little bit of panic, which I understand. It's a very scary thing for most people, but we do need to stick to the facts and cdc.gov is, is a great source for that. Yeah, and, and don't you think this is a hard time for medical professionals as well, because people call, people log on, people have questions and they want something definitive, but sometimes it just doesn't exist. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think also people are trying to figure out what to do. You know, yep. I, I mean, people are locked in their homes and they're worried about this. They're hearing it on the news. And I just want to say, I think that the people who are taking this seriously, social distancing, sheltering in place, you guys are doing a great job. Like, keep doing what you're doing. I think that's really, really important. And the other, uh, the other part of what you can do is actually protect yourself by being healthy. You know, go out and not go out, but you know, do that exercise. There's all kinds of digital online exercises that are available for free now. Um, you know, eat well, sleep. These are things that are going to, that are going to boost your immune system. So, you know, when, uh, you know, whatever time it is, weeks, months, when you actually go out there and coronavirus will still be out there, that immune system is going to be really important to protect you. So I can't emphasize that enough. And if you have chronic disease or you have underlying issues, it's really important to take care of those as well. So you're, you're basically strong and you're armed to fight against the virus or any virus that's out there. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think at the end of the day, we are learning better habits. This will impact. These yes. aren't, these aren't bad habits to wash our hands carefully to disinfect as long as we don't get Paranoid. I mean, and I think I was talking to someone the other day and I was saying it, it's not like even if by summer we can resume some semblance of our normal lives, coronavirus won't still be an issue. So whatever healthy habits we're developing, I think everyone's yeah. like the world will never be the same. The line for the sink <laughs> will always yeah. be a long line for the sink. And, and maybe that's not a bad thing. Absolutely. I think it's going to be a new social norm, just like after 9-11, you know, what happened at the airports changed yeah. and and it became the new norm i i do think that there's going to be habits we take away from this that will be the new norm and certainly hand washing i just can't em emphasize enough how important it is and just to be kind of mindful of what you're touching your face your eyes uh, making sure you cough uh, in your sleep your and elbow. Yep. try and, to stay and home when that. you're sick those are great habits it's good habits all right dr hansa bargava thank you so much a uh, web md medical editor joining us from atlanta stay safe and healthy thanks so much for your insight thank you all right and uh, let's take you over to capitol hill now because uh, we are watching a press conference Would there uh, where uh, we are hearing from uh, senators and this is a, a, a to be honest I'm told this is going on right now and uh, I think they're going to be talking obviously about the coronavirus bill so uh, let's listen in and, 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 and let's hear what they're saying. Get an additional $600. So it doesn't the legislation doesn't envision the ability to have uh, someone pick $10 an hour or $15 an hour or $20 an hour uh, getting a maximum of 100% of their income. This legislation would not stop at 100% of your income. This legislation would allow you in unemployment to make more than you do in employment. We know that that is a drafting error and we are simply providing an amendment to fix that so that you do not make more in unemployment than you do when you're working. Lindsay. <clears throat> we'll know in about an hour as to whether or not this is a drafting error. I hope they're right, but I'm concerned. Let me tell you why. Under this proposal that they agreed to last night, on unemployment, you would be making $24.07 an hour in South Carolina. There are a lot of jobs in South Carolina that do not pay $24.07. I've been one of the biggest advocates of helping the unemployment insurance system as part of a relief package. The maximum benefit, as Tim, Tim said, was $326. My goal was to add some federal dollars to the pot to get you back to what you were making 
with a cap of $600, which is an income of about $49,000. This bill pays you more not to work than if you were working. Very few people are going to turn down a 24 hour dollar deal not to work. To work for 15. The problem for employers is that you've been put out of business because of containment policies that I think will continue aggressively for a while. What do you tell an employee if you own a restaurant or bar in Myrtle Beach? Are you going to say, let me put you on the payroll at your salary of $15 an hour? Or are you going to say, go to the unemployment office and sign up for unemployment, get as much as you can. I know you want the money, you need the money, and there will be a job waiting on you. If you're a nurse, aide, making $15 or $16 an hour, you're on the front lines here. A lot of doctor's offices are going to have to roll back because elective surgery is no longer a source of income for a bunch of doctors. So you're going to have all these well-trained nurses that are going to make $24 an hour on unemployment. You're literally incentivizing taking people out of the workforce at a time when we need critical infrastructure supplied with workers. If this is not a drafting era, then it's the worst idea I've seen in a long time and I'm saying a lot given the fact we're in Washington. To my Democratic colleagues, I have been one of your strongest supporters for upping unemployment insurance, but I never in my wildest dream believed that we would incentivize people to stop working to take unemployment by increasing unemployment wages to $24 an hour. You want to destroy what's left of the economy? Pass it the way it's written. If you want to help people, give them their wages, but don't pay them more not to work. So I come at this as uh, somebody who started uh, some, some businesses and some that became large businesses. I also come at it from the standpoint of an uh, individual who just finished his time as governor about 15 months ago. In my time as governor, we focused on how could we get people off unemployment by getting them a job. And we were able to do that. We added in eight years 1.7 million jobs. We were down to 61,000 people on unemployment uh, when I left office. So as this happened, I was very uh, supportive of helping workers. Uh, they don't have a job uh, on top of the, the gig workers, the people that are getting tips, uh, and also using our existing unemployment system because it's the fastest way to make sure we have a system and the money gets out there. So I've been very supportive. Now we have a virus that we know a lot of people can't work um, for a variety of reasons, some because government sets it up, because others because the economy is, is hurt. So we've got to help them. But the moment we can go back to work, we cannot create an incentive for people to say, I don't need to come back to work because I can do better someplace else. These employers are going to need these workers to rebuild this economy. Uh, so we cannot be paying people more money uh, on unemployment with it than what they would get paid in their job. Uh, so I'm very supportive of this amendment. Uh, it's, it's the right thing to do. I know we still have a lot of work to do to get this uh, get, uh, coronavirus behind us. But the moment that happens and we can reopen this economy, we have got to get people back to work. Uh, so we can rebuild this economy. And it's, it's like what uh, Tim said, people want to work, but don't create the wrong incentive. And you're, if we do, we're going to hurt a lot of businesses and a lot of families uh, in this country. This is not a drafting error. This was deliberately negotiated with Republican senators, with the White House, with the Democratic senators. So if this is not changed at all, are you going to force the Senate to go through all the procedural steps to get to a final vote? I am very hopeful that we will get this done very quickly. I think the American people need the resources in this bill. But, but let me just reinforce why this drafting error, I hope, is so important. I know some disagree with that, but let, I like to do math and sometimes I do it kind of fast, but let me just be simple with it. Someone making $15 an hour in South Carolina, working 40 hours a week, makes $600. If you're unemployed, you can get up to $326, you get half your income. So that $600 wage now becomes 300 in unemployment. What the federal government does is it comes in and puts 600 on top of that 300. So now, instead of making 600 when you were working, you're now making 900 not working. How long do you stay in unemployment if you're making 50% more than you were working? 
The answer, 16 weeks. We believe, I hope that this was an actual error. Uh, this bill needs to be done without any question. I think we can get it done here today, and I believe that we'll have an amendment, I pray, in just a couple hours. Senator Graham, why do you think it's not a drafting error? All right, you've been listening to a press conference from Capitol Hill. That's Senator Graham and Senator Tim Scott from South Carolina. They're talking about the stimulus bill that we've been watching so carefully. It looked like there was an agreement on it, and there was an agreement announced last night. Uh, what they're talking about is the $250 billion in unemployment to help the Americans that are out of work. What they are arguing is that the way it is written now, that some workers will get paid more on unemployment than they would get paid by going back to work. And what they are taking issue with is if you are making 600 when you're working, 900 when you're not working, that will not encourage American workers to go back to work even when they can. So they are calling it maybe a drafting error. Someone is saying, nope, this was, uh, you know, worked into the bill. This is what both sides agreed upon. We'll see how that affects uh, the vote that is expected on Capitol Hill. As people thought this had a green light and it could go forward, it now looks like this is one of the bumps in the road. We'll see how big of a bump it turns out to be. All right, if you are just joining us uh, now, I'm Claudine Wong. This is your coronavirus update live from Fox. We are coming to you every day at 1 p.m. Eastern. 10 a.m. Pacific, we start at that time. We go for about two hours. We are streamed all the time on coronavirusnow.com. We are also on Facebook pages at our sister stations across the country, and so you can watch us there. You can also make comments there. Any medical questions you have that we can give to our medical experts, we try to get as many answers for you as we can. As we know, it is a very uncertain time, and people, there's a lot people want to know. All right, let's take you now to Houston. We want to go to Melissa Wilson, who is a medical reporter at Fox 26 Houston. Melissa, thanks so much for joining us. And I'm told that you recently went on a tour. I mean, the hospitals are kind of this, this interesting place. We know they're overloaded. We know the healthcare workers are heroes on the front lines here. And we know there's a lot of people suffering, people who have a coronavirus and COVID-19 and trying to get treated. Tell me what you saw in the local hospitals there. So impressed with what I saw there. They have really worked hard to make extra beds available just immediately. Overnight, they started putting this into place. One of the most interesting things is that we had a hospital here. It's, it's a major hospital, it's Memorial Hermann, and it's a major medical center. But they, what they did is they had a, a hospital almost on standby for years because it was a it's a highly infectious disease unit it's got about 44 beds in it and they haven't even used it since the Ebola outbreak years ago but they've had to keep it functional so that it would be fresh and ready in case some type of infectious disease ever came again and so it's incredible it's got rooms that have negative pressure in it so that means all that air that could have germs is filtered outside so there's a big unit in each room and the the dirty the germy air goes into this unit and it blows right out the window it's really remarkable to see and then they also let me wear those I'm, i know you probably heard of the ppe that's the, the protective gear that you put on and they let me put that on and see what it was like and i have to tell you at first it was almost a little bit claustrophobic because mm -hmm. your whole body you don't you almost feel like an astronaut but then they start pumping oxygen into it and you get a fresh flow of air and then you're you kind of relax and you can breathe easy but these medical workers are going through a lot but we definitely have the equipment and the space here to really take care of those serious patients how does that uh, that change you know kind of really how they feel about a attacking this virus I mean I know when we hear from healthcare workers across the country when there are not enough beds when they don't they all can't get into the you know the PPEs or they don't have enough mm -hmm. N95 masks it does change the job I mean in New York, they're worried they don't have enough beds. The numbers don't seem to, you know, bear out that they will. In California, mm -hmm. the governor has already talked about, you know, maybe putting patients in dorms at the UC, you know, across the country. So, or UCs across mm -hmm. the state, I should say. When you're talking to healthcare workers there, when there are enough beds, when they, you know, they mm -hmm. have one to spare so that you can try it on, and it changes the way they approach this, I would think. Oh, it does. Absolutely. And, you know, that was in the very beginning when I got to, to see that equipment. And now there is no way that there is even one to spare. In fact, changes at hospitals went to, into effect just today here. So when I was there only, I would say about a week ago.
All right. It looks like we lost Melissa Wilson in Houston. We'll try to get her back, but that is interesting when she talks about being able to tour one of these infectious disease places a week ago. Sure. Try on one of these PPEs. Sure. Come through here and we'll show you what we have a week later. That's how quickly the situation changes. So uh, we appreciate talking to Melissa Wilson, even however briefly to get that perspective. And uh, if we have uh, the time, we'll certainly try to get back to her for more on that. Uh, if you're just joining us, I'm Claudine Wong, and this is our daily coronavirus update live from Fox. We come to you every weekday. We start at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. Go for a couple of hours, check in across the country. And so we're happy that you're joining us now and uh, happy that you can be a part of this. We want to go now to Las Vegas, Nevada, and go to Ryan Lewis, who is the CEO of Global Cannabinoids. And, uh, you know, hand sanitizer, that's where you are these days? Yeah, it's actually, it's, it's pretty uh, unbelievable that now we're manufacturing hand sanitizers, but, um, you know, our company, Global Cannabinoids, we're one of the largest producer distributors of hemp-derived cannabinoids, CBD oil. And we're always analyzing trends in the industry, looking for you know interesting products that we can combine our cannabinoid ingredients with. And a lot of people don't know that cannabinoids actually have antibacterial and antimicrobial properties. So it, it, it makes for a logical addition into any product formulation that would be antibacterial. Um, last year, we launched a CBD infused soap and that did extremely well. So we had our eye on sanitizer and we were analyzing Google search results for consumers and noticed a spike in sanitizer. So we decided to launch a cannabinoid infused hand sanitizer. And so we added uh, cannabinoids into a base formula that's manufactured at one of our partners facilities. You know, it's uh, according to FDA regulations, it's 70% ethanol alcohol with vitamin E and moisturizers. Um, but the demand we've been getting for sanitizer since then is unbelievable. You know, we've also donate a portion of all all the sanitizers that we're manufacturing to first responders, medical professionals in need here in Las Vegas. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, in situations like this, you know, it's, it's imperative that you adapt as a business and, um, you know, the demand right now is for sanitizer yeah. and we're in a great position Ryan, to provide that. I, I, from what I hear, the demand for CBD in general and, and deliveries is up across your industry. Uh, I'm wondering in capacity and the ability, I mean, it's hard to find hand sanitizer anywhere. You know, how much are you making? Are you seeing that demand, the supply meet the demand? And is there an, you know, an up cost for buying hand sanitizer with the CBD in it? So ironically, the, the reality is, is that we're actually making more sanitizers without any CBD. Um, you know, being from the cannabis industry, we use ethanol on a regular basis in the extraction process. So we have huge supplies of ethanol. We control supply chains of it. And so we're actually, uh, we've secured contracts for hundreds of thousands of gallons of ethanol per week. We have a facility that then converts it into a sanitizer, but you know, we're not in the business of price gouging. Of course, when you add cannabinoids to the product formulation, the reality is, is it's now a premium product. Cannabinoids are not necessarily cheap. However, the bulk of our orders right now are for big box retail, you know, hospital chains, and they um, are preferring, you know, just to get hand sanitizer just good old hand stuff. sanitizer yeah, the basic stuff so are you doing direct to consumer so you have the big orders of the people who are just trying to get enough so they can make sure that everyone is safe and they're and they're making sure the protocols for if you talk about big hospitals or different things like that uh, are you getting direct to consumer people who uh like cbd and and, and like that and ha have had that work for them saying maybe this is an added bonus that i can add to to whatever i was using yeah absolutely we have a brand that we've uh developed called Medically Minded. So we have a hand sanitizer that's launching on uh, medicallymindedcbd.com. And we're actually pricing our cannabinoid infused hand sanitizer. It's cheaper than what you can find online for just regular sanitizers right now. And that's really to meet that consumer demand because we are a bulk and wholesale B2B supplier. So the reality is we're trying to, you know, uh, address all, um, you know, demand in the marketplace and, and get people the products that they need um, in this, you know, in this situation because, um, you know, this, this, situ this coronavirus isn't going away for a long time and hand sanitizers, face masks, that's the new norm. Uh -huh. You know, that's what, that's what our, it's going to be part of our lifestyle going forward.
Yep, absolutely. All right, Ryan Lewis, thanks so much for that. Uh, interesting to hear the innovation and, and how it can impact and really help, you know, whether whether or not you're using the cannabinoids or you're making the regular sanitizer. Uh, I appreciate adding anything to our supply chain right now. Thank you. All right, and if you're just joining us now, I'm Claudine Wong. This is your coronavirus update live from Fox. We come to you every weekday, 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. That's when we start. We go for a couple of hours and we check in across the country talking about everything from medicine to business to stocks and markets and, and everything in between. And right now what we're talking about is that stimulus package. We know there was an agreement Since overnight where they say they, they met a threshold where they could all agree that this is the package moving forward to trillion dollars. We just heard from Senator Lindsey Graham in the last bit saying he and Senator Tim Scott from South Carolina both are concerned about the unemployment package that is a part of that saying for some of the people in their state it would mean that their workers would make more on unemployment than they would by actually getting their jobs back and they are concerned about what that would do to the economy and the workforce. Uh, we are taking you now live to the Senate floor as they continue to talk about the stimulus bill. We were expecting a vote coming up. We'll see how what uh, Senator Graham and Senator Scott uh, said earlier will affect things. Let's listen into what they're saying on the Senate floor right now. The individual workers who are impacted economically it included changes in unemployment insurance so that those who find themselves out of a job can promptly take advantage of these benefits and made paid sick and family leave available for workers impacted by the virus. That's what we did in these first two bills. Were they perfect? Well, no. The second bill in particular fell short in a number of areas. It was largely negotiated by Secretary of the Tre Treasury Mnuchin and Speaker Pelosi. But we decided that in the interest of the greater good in the country and the people who were hurting during this crisis, that we in the Senate would pass it expeditiously. As the saying goes, you can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. We acted quickly to get both bills to the president's desk because the circumstances demanded it. Sadly, over the last few days, our colleagues on the other side of the aisle have been oblivious to the sense of urgency that every other American seems to understand. After the original intense bipartisan negotiations, we were finalizing a third relief bill, which included, by definition, ideas from both Republicans and Democrats. We were optimistic that we'd be able to take up and pass the bill on Sunday, or at least get it started and pass the bill on Monday, but clearly that didn't happen. All right, you are listening live to Senator John Corwin of Texas speaking from the Senate floor. It is an interesting change in tone that we have seen over the last half hour or so. You know, we have Senator Corwin, if you were just listening to him, talking about uh, Democrats on the other side of the aisle and the negotiations that took place. Uh, we also heard from Senator Lindsey Graham and Senator Tim Scott from South Carolina talking about concerns about the unemployment provisions in this $2 trillion stimulus package, saying that workers in their state would make more by not working instead of uh, making what they were making as workers. So they're concerned about people wanting to stay on unemployment instead of returning to the workforce if and when uh, they are able to do that. And so that is going to be the ongoing discussion on Capitol Hill right now. The markets have been good when there was talk uh, that the stimulus bill would go to a vote and was likely to pass. Now we'll see what happens as they continue to discuss things on the Senate floor and to see if these are major hurdles they'll need to overcome or small bumps in the road. We'll continue to watch that for you, of course. Let's go now to Atlanta, and we want to talk to Dr. Hansa Bhargava, WebMD medical actor, uh, editor, as we continue to try to, you know, work through all our questions that people are having. You know, I think the main one is is the question of the socially distancing. You know, when we're at parks and we're at the grocery store, it doesn't seem like that's happening, even when people are sort of making the effort. I think the grocery store is a very difficult place unless they're stopping people from going in, you know, all the time. Or if you're in a large urban environment, people in New York City, for example, you know, I talked to a reporter there, if everyone from his building went down to walk around the block, you're not gonna get six feet. Um, how paranoid should people be about that? Well, I think, uh, Claudina, 
that people really need to take it seriously. And, uh, you know, it seems like it's paranoia, but social distancing has parameters as defined by the CDC and other expert health agencies. And it really is keeping that distance of six feet. And there's reasons for that. When people have coughs, for example, and, you know, COVID, if they're infected with COVID-19, the respiratory droplets can actually persist in the air for about three hours. They can travel for a few feet. And so you may not even know that you are infected and then suddenly cough and, you know, that that could potentially infect other people. So I think the social distancing parameters about staying in house and a lot of states, as you mentioned before, have in shelter, you know, uh, stay uh, shelter, um, the sheltering uh, provision as well is really trying to stay home away from people six feet away and good hand washing. And that is how we prevent the infection from surging so that the hospitals are just not able to handle it. You know, let's talk about masks, too. I've seen a lot of great yeah. posts from friends who are sewing masks. You know, there's a little bit of an elastic uh, shortage, they say, of trying to find them. But they're fabric masks. They, uh, you know, varying different patterns making their way. You know, and, and the idea is, yes, obviously the N95 ones are the, are the best. And we want to make sure that we donate all the ones that we have available. But these cloth masks that people are making, because we want to do something to help. Who should be using those? I mean, uh, is it better for healthcare professionals to use anything if there's a shortage and they can't get enough? Is it the store workers to be using it? Or does it still go back to only use this if, if you're not feeling well and you're not trying to get people sick around you? I wish I could tell you that those cloth masks would help everyone, especially the healthcare providers and the doctors and nurses who are at the front lines who really, there's a crisis coming in the next few weeks in terms of, in, and some hospitals are already seeing it in terms of the personal protective equipment. Uh, unfortunately, the cloth masks really do not help that. What they really need are N95 respirator masks, which is what the CDC and the World Health Organization recommends. And there is a, you know, there, there is a deficiency of that right now. Now, the good news is that some companies are coming forward like 3M and Ford and several other companies that are trying to meet the demand. We need millions of masks in the mm -hmm. hospitals. We just do. I have, uh, you know, patients <clears throat> coming in sick and, you know, the doctors and nurses are being told to use the same N95 mask from patient to patient to patient, which is not good for them because they could get infected when they take the masks on and off but also not good for the patients. Because if you just think about it, you know, you don't really want to use the same glove from patient to patient to patient. So right. why would you necessarily use the same N95 mask? So, it, you know, it's a real issue, but there are some great ideas that are out there. And in, in fact, if, if you'd like to hear about it, Claudina, I do know of an innovation center here in Atlanta that's actually with two doctors that have come up with an idea about that too. And, and sure, what, what is the idea that they're coming up with? Yeah, so they are, uh, we have Dr. Emily Blum, who's a pediatric urologist, and Dr. Joanna Newton, who's an oncologist, uh, who have been working at, uh, with Georgia Tech, as well as the global collabor uh, GCMI, which is a global collaboration of medical innovations that have given pro bono their time. And they've come up with a design for an N95, which they can print from a 3D printer. So what they, I, I, I spoke to them a couple, uh, yesterday, actually, and what they are asking us to do as the audience, as patients, as people is, you know, stay in, do the shelter in place for three to four weeks, because what they want to do is take those designs, open source them to other companies and ramp up production. But they are saying it's a three to four week timeline. So that's really important from a patient perspective, because if you show up with not even a COVID infection, but say appendicitis or a heart attack, if the hospitals are infiltrated with inf people who are infected with COVID-19 and, you know, all the beds are full, you're not going to be seen even yeah. for those other issues. So what they're asking is, in, you know, give us time to get the equipment that's necessary, the beds in place. So just stay shelter in place for a few more weeks for us and we can be ready for you. Lots of innovation. Just need to buy them some time to get that innovation in place. That's great news. And uh, certainly we hope everyone shelters in place for a thousand different reasons, but also, you know, flattening the curve is looking out for our healthcare yeah. workers and looking out for ourselves. If a family member gets sick in two weeks from now, we want to make sure there is a bed for them as well. All right, Dr. Hansa Bargava, thank you so much for joining us. Medical Glad to be editor here. at WebMD. Thank you so much.
All right, if you are just joining us, thanks so much for being a part of our coronavirus update live from Fox. We come to you every weekday. We start about 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. We go for a couple of hours. We check in with uh, everyone across the country, giving you a big picture of really what's happening right now. And one of the things that we're watching that is happening right now is what is happening on the Senate floor. Senator John Corwin of Texas was uh, speaking earlier about uh, the stimulus bill. There have been uh, there has been actually a little bit of movement on Capitol Hill in terms from the Republican side and the senators uh, speaking out. Senator John Corwin talking about not agreeing with people on the Democratic side of the aisle at, at certain points in his remarks. Uh, he went on uh, to speak about much more, but Senator Lindsey Graham, Senator Tim Scott from South Carolina also held a press conference uh, this morning just within the last half hour talking about their concerns about how this two trillion dollar stimulus package was going to be rolled out. They were specifically focusing on the unemployment part of that stimulus package and the 350 or 250 billion, I should say, uh, in unemployment aid. Their contention was that the aid, which has been boosted up, they took the unemployment insurance and they said, okay, we're gonna give you more. So we're gonna give you more money if you can't work. Well, Senator Graham and Senator Scott said, you're giving them, you're giving the workers too much money. Saying in fact that not working would be more beneficial than working. And so that is an issue within the package, which is the largest rescue package uh, that we've ever seen nearly half of what the government spends all year when you're talking about $2 trillion. And so that debate continues to happen on Capitol Hill. Uh, even after overnight, they said, yep, we've got an agreement and this should go forward. You know, the markets are responding well to this right now. If we look at the Dow Jones, it's up almost 5%. The S&P 500 also up. But again, this is the vote that we're expecting from the Senate. Then we are expecting a voice vote from the House and then the president uh, expecting to sign it. So if we talk about what they're discussing, there's so much to talk about. This package, 500 billion for industries hard hit, 350 billion for small business loans, direct payments of families up to 3,000. We should make that clear that you have to be making about $75,000 or less. It kind of meters out, uh, it goes up a little bit. You might get a little bit if you make a little more than 75,000. Uh, but mostly it is for people who make under 75,000 and children. You've also got 250 billion in unemployment aid. And again, that is the point of contention that we are hearing from the senators from South Carolina. You also have 100 billion for hospitals and related health systems. And so that is also an issue. I wanna know, I wanna see if we can bring up the map for you when you talk about the latest numbers when we're talking about uh, from Johns Hopkins University. And I'll just give you these numbers as we talk about how this is affecting everyone you know, across the nation. Worldwide, we are seeing those cases at 438,000. And so in China, you've got 81,000, but keep in mind that country is slowly trying to reopen businesses. So we'll be keeping an eye on them as we go forward and really seeing how this all plays out there. Uh, you know, Italy still has a lot of cases at 69,000. Here in the U.S., we've got 55,000 cases. New York continues to be the epicenter. You know, we had checked in with someone from New York talking about how the situation is affecting them there. They did have cases doubling every three days, but that is not the case now. Now it's about four, a little over four days. And so these are trends we're watching as we see testing ramp up across the country and as we see... Um, you know, just how the country is responding. Again, the live picture you're looking at right now is from the Senate floor as we continue to watch senators take to the floor and take to the microphone and speak about the stimulus bill, speak about what they are, are talking about and, and all the different parts of this bill. It is a huge, massive, bill, $2 trillion. And so there's a lot of different parts. And if you keep in mind, the negotiations over what was happening and everything we heard from both sides is instead of taking things out, they were adding. So Republicans uh, had drafted really the first versions of this and the Democrats then weighed in on, on the different things that they wanted to make a point of. One of the things that we know that Democratic lawmakers took issue with was oversight over the amount of money that was going to the industries and the corporations and the, and, and the big dollars there. Uh, the Democrats saying that they wanted more oversight, more ways to monitor how that money was going to be used, more ways to make sure that it wasn't used for big bonuses and that it was actually used to pull so many industries that are struggling, you know, really out of the situation they were in. So again, Capitol Hill is going to be the place that we watch 
consistently over the day and through tomorrow and through the week as we see the stimulus package and see where it will go from here. All right, I'm Claudine Wong. Thanks for joining us for this coronavirus update live from Fox. Want to take you now to New Jersey to Mike and Lauren Sorrentino. Hey, Mike, oh, there you guys are. Hi. Hey, hey, what's up, guys? How are you? We're good. If you Mike looks familiar, with, then you probably are a fan of Jersey Shore in the situation. But we know both of your faces uh, as uh, you really have been public about the journey that both of you have been on and and really uh, the recovery. Three years sober, Mike. Uh, we got four years over four, four years. Four years. Four years from this addiction to painkillers on a trip to Australia in February of 2012. Right. That's a, a quick kind of uh, how it it started. Yeah, yeah, it was definitely uh, around that time period that I was in active addiction and I saw it help a little, a little time after that. Okay, and so how has recovery been? Because certainly when we talk about, uh, you know, the shelter in place, I, I love that, you know, Lauren's with you right now because we talk about needing people to keep us on track. You have been very, uh, you know, public and talking about how big of a role she has played. So good job, Lauren, and, and just, you know, being uh, each other's rock when we need you to, you know, we need that, that space. How has it been kind of sheltering in place? How do you think that's going to change in terms of, you know, I know, AA has done online meetings and really tried to reach out to people. Um, well, yeah, that's part of, you know, the reason why we're here right now is to spread a light in the darkness for people that are seeking recovery or that are in recovery, that there are also meetings online, as well as with Banyan Treatment Centers, all facilities, all 11 facilities are fully staffed and ready for any intake in case anyone needs to obviously uh, go to rehab. So we're, you know, just spreading that light right now. Yeah, because the stress of a situation, we can't downplay that. We've talked a lot about mental health, and as people are stressed out about their own health, about their loved ones, not being able to go out, having their daily routine changed, all of that can impact someone's recovery no matter where they are because the recovery is a process. It's, it's not a destination, right? Uh, yes, 100%. yeah, exactly. I would just recommend to take everything one day at a time. Um, this particular situation, just like all, oh, this too shall pass uh, eventually, you know, and tough times don't last. Tough people do. When it comes to recovery, um, I can't stress it enough. Um, we partnered with Banyan Treatment Centers to really, you know, sh shed the message of, you know, experience, strength, and hope. And, um, you know, we don't recommend anyone trying to detox at home. Um, you know, that could end up you leading uh, into a hospital. And we all know our hospitals are overrun right now. Um, so please call our facility and our professionals at 1-888-270-5712, guys. All right. Unfortunately, we're out of time because I had a thousand more questions for you guys, but they're telling me we got to go. So thank you for so much for joining us. Uh, the best yes, of luck guys. on your recovery. Stay safe, guys, one day at a time. Stay healthy. You too. Bye, Stay guys. Stay healthy. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you for joining us. That is going to do it for this broadcast. This stream, however, is going to continue from Phoenix, Arizona. Arizona, the folks over at Fox 10 Phoenix are going to keep bringing you the latest live pictures. We've got news conferences. We're watching the Senate floor, of course, in Capitol Hill. They'll be all over the country. You can visit coronavirusnow.com for the latest news in your area and beyond. I'm Claudine Wong. Thanks so much for joining us. This broadcast will be back tomorrow.
Hello and welcome to the daily coronavirus update live from Fox. I'm Claudine Wong. Thanks so much for joining us. We are going to be live streaming for you every day. If you have joined us before, thanks so much for coming back. If you're new to this program, let's just tell you we start every day at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. We live stream on coronavirusnow.com, also on the Facebook pages of our sister stations across the country. So we appreciate you being here and we always like to start off with the big picture, the latest numbers to give you a look at how the coronavirus is affecting us. And here are the latest numbers from Johns Hopkins University. If you take a look at worldwide, we're at 438,749 cases. Those are confirmed cases. China, 81,000, but important to note, business is slowly reopening in that country. Italy, which has seen some good news in terms of their numbers leveling out a bit, 69,000 cases there in the U.S. We're at more than 55 thousand cases worldwide. We take a look at things. Canada now imposing a mandatory self isolation for anyone returning to Canada. That's under the quarantine act there. New York City. That's going to be our big one here in the US of uh, the states that are seeing huge surges in their cases. All right, more in the United States. Let's take a look specifically at what we're dealing with here. 55,243 cases. 802 people have died from coronavirus. 354 recovered. Those are the numbers that we're watching. Obviously, these keep changing. We do know at least 18 states have stay at home orders, and that affects about half of the U.S. population. So when you talk about how this has overtaken our way of life, those numbers are big. All right, let's see how the stock markets are reacting right now, because certainly we're watching that. We have seen green territory today, and that's good news. The Dow Jones is up about 4.8%. The S&P also up about 3%. And so that's good news. It seems to be reacting to uh, obviously the stimulus package that has made its way through the Senate. We get closer to agreement. We saw a rally yesterday. Analysts say it's losing a little bit of steam in the global markets, but we'll keep an eye on the numbers for you and to see how our markets are reacting. All right, and if you're just joining us again, we are streaming for you every day, 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific, coronavirusnow.com, also on your Facebook pages for our sister stations across the country. We do want to focus, though, our attention right now on New York City because, wow, that is a state that has seen some big numbers and some big increases really over the last couple of days. We've got reporter Mike Sachs from Fox 5 New York joining us live from home. And we talked to you as you are holed up in your house and really the situation there. When you got the number of confirmed cases in New York doubling every three days, it is a scary time. Do we think, Mike, that these are because everyone's getting tested or that the infection is just rapidly spreading? It's probably a combination, right? It's a combination. Right now they're saying it's because a lot of the testing has been coming in faster and more furious as from the earlier days. But of course the virus is still spreading too. Now that number, every 3.4 days the numbers are doubling. That was the figure from yesterday. Today, the figure it's slowing. It's to every 4.7 days the numbers are doubling. These figures are from Governor Cuomo's press conference earlier today and it's a downward trajectory. It was every two days on Sunday, every 3.4 days on Tuesday, 4.7 days today. So he warned that these numbers are fluid. We may not be sure if these are actually accurate, but if that's the trajectory, it means that the social distancing and the business closures that we've been seeing here in the city and the state may be working. Yeah, and, and that's what we hope, right? That's the flattening the, the, the curve that maybe we, we have some impact of the numbers and we're not just a victim to our numbers. You know, the, the big question is the whole reason everyone's staying at home, the whole reason you're at home right now is so that the hospitals don't get overwhelmed. And certainly that's mm -hmm. been the big fear when you talk about the shortages of masks and protective gear, ventilators. How is New York doing in terms of making sure your healthcare workers have what they need? New York still needs to get more. Uh, Governor Cuomo has said they're anticipating about 140 or so, or 130 or so thousand beds necessary. Right now, there are 53,000 beds. He's trying to get more medical professionals in, more building of hospitals ready with federal help. Uh, he projects perhaps with a very aggressive ramp up measures to get close to 120,000 beds. Uh, and that's that's something. It's a lot more than what, we, that, yes. what New York State currently has. Uh, but then there's also getting the ventilators. That's a big issue. Uh, he anticipates needing 30,000 ventilators in the state. Right now there are 4,000. There's uh, 7,000 more on order, another 4,000 coming in. Uh, that gets close, but not enough 
to the to the 30,000 necessary total. He spoke about perhaps working out a way to get people to share ventilators two at a time. Uh, this is wow. all worst case scenario, but they're projections that are still quite real. Yeah, you know, when we look at the numbers, I mean, we hear about a case of a, a, a teenager who passed away in California, and we're certainly, it makes us look at the numbers, and specifically because in New York you have so many numbers to look at, um, you know, in terms of who's being most impacted and who's going to need those hospital beds. I know the numbers I looked at said 95% of New York City is almost 200 deaths. Uh, half were under the age of 75. So while we are worried about our senior population, is this this deep analysis going on, on really getting the message out to how many different people can be affected regardless? No one's no one's immune from from the impacts of this virus. Yeah, so uh, the governor was, was also, uh, and I keep referring to the governor because, of course, that's where most of our information is coming. The mayor hasn't yet spoken in New York City, but Governor Cuomo has said and, and told young people throughout the state, of course, you can still get this. You can be a vector for the virus. One moment. Uh, great, Akiva. Now, I'm talking on the news, but thank you very much for letting me know. That's my uh, son you know coming what? in Mike, telling me that I love package it. arrived. I think yesterday, <laughs> yes, well, packages are important. And uh, yesterday, I know you said you sent them on a car ride around, but this is the world we're yeah. living in, right? Like, how old are yeah, your kids? Yeah, absolutely. How old yeah, are you? Uh, that's my six and a half year old who's irrepressible. My three year old is, is a little more pays attention to what we say, so he hasn't come barging in. But you might have heard knocking on the window. That was my son trying to get my attention. He well, found multiple will, ways to get into I will the tell room. you, Mike, if they, want, <laughs> if they want some TV time, we could all use a little goodness in our life. And, yeah. and, and kids make us smile all the time. So I, I actually <laughs> love hearing, hearing the sounds of your kids in the background because it reminds us. Yeah.